So remember when we were in the retina, the photoreceptor, we didn't talk about it much, but the photoreceptor has no axon. Why doesn't it have an axon? Because it has nowhere, it has nowhere far to go. It just has a synaptic terminal that terminates right on the next cell in line, which is bipolar cell. Um, and the same is true of the hair cell. It doesn't have an axon. It's not a neuron anyway. Um, it j is just releasing transmitter. Um, and it's releasing transmitter on, in, in this case, now we're talking about the inner hair cell, so it's releasing transmitter onto a neuron, a peripheral neuron that sits in the spiral ganglion. The hair cell is responding, as you know, to uh, sound waves, to, to, to the displacement of the, uh, of the hair bundle, and it's either uh, increasing its level of, uh, of release, of neurotransmitter release. It, the neurotransmitter of the hair cell is glutamate, so it's either increasing the amount of glutamate released or it's decreasing it. And it starts from a, a, a not from a totally hyperpolarized view, uh, starting point, uh, similar to the photoreceptor, it's got a, a slightly depolarized resting potential. So then it, it can signal both of these directions, and that's useful, because in, in this situation, it's this frequency that matters, it's not the direction that matters. Um, the next cell in line is going to simply respond to that. And so up to about uh, one to three kilohertz, the, uh, the response of the spiral ganglion cell is going to be in phase with the, uh, with the hair cell, with the hair cell response. Past that, the spiral ganglion cell cannot follow. You can't have um, one action potential every, uh, uh, every 50 microseconds. So, um, so you can't follow at 20 kilohertz. So it's, it's a different coding mechanism at that point. But suffice it to say, this is a very fast um, mechanism because these MET channels are anotropic. There's this huge driving force in from the, uh, from the endocochlear potential uh, of the endolymph, which is around plus 80 millivolts, and the high potassium. So what can go wrong here? Well, the MET channel is, uh, first of all, the endocochlear potential is, is um, vulnerable. It's vulnerable to all manner of uh, uh, mutations in connexins that are very important to the stria vascularis. So connex, connexin um, mutations are, caught, are one of the most common causes of deafness. The other thing that can go wrong is that MET channel, it's opening, it's, it's a, it's a nonspecific cation channel, and not only can cations go through there, but some nasty stuff can go in there too. So certain um, antibiotics, aminoglycoside antibiotics, and certain chemotherapeutics such as cisplatin will go in through the MET channel and kill the, the hair cells. So these are ototoxic drugs. Um, in general, uh, the drugs that kill cochlear hair cells and the drugs that kill vestibular hair cells are, um, uh, are distinct with some that kill both. They have preferences. One is more, uh, prefers to kill cochlear hair cells. One may prefer to kill um, vestibular hair cells, and a few kill both. Um, this is a, 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 a common cause of late onset deafness, is, uh, is this exposure to either uh, chemotherapeutics or um, antibiotics. And in order to make sure that this doesn't happen, one of the things that one can do is just make sure that it's, it's extremely well uh, monitored, people are made aware of the risks, so that they can, uh, they can uh, make the doctor, make you aware the, the moment that there's any um, question that there might be a loss of hearing. Um, and that also so blood, vet, blood levels can be monitored. Fr from the, uh, once the, the information has been uh, received by the spiral ganglion cell, then all we have to do is get that all the way through the cochlear um, nerve, the, the cochlear portion of the vestibular cochlear nerve all the way to the brain. And at that point, there, there are only a couple more things that can go wrong. 
we can get a, uh, a, a um, an infection of that nerve, a neuritis, um, and and even more uh, more commonly, there is the, there are these uh, what are called vestibular schwannomas that used to be called acoustic neuromas, and they may start on the vestibular root. These are um, benign uh, uh, neoplasias that um, grow, the little tumors that grow on the root of the cranial nerve, they typically start at the vestibular root, but they will expand over to the cochlear root. And if that happens, there will be a decrease in, in um, there will be a loss of hearing. It's important to recognize that a loss of hearing may, the first sign of loss of hearing may be the occurrence of tinnitus. Indeed, if a, if a young person has tinnitus, you want to make sure that hearing is okay. You want to make sure that that's not a sign of a loss of hearing because it commonly can be. And one final point, let's make sure that we understand that in order to get this positive sign, this tinnitus, you have to have experience with the, with the, uh, with the sensory experience. So what would happen if a, um, can, can a deaf person ever get tinnitus? A, per, a congenitally deaf person, a person who has never heard before, has never had hearing before, can they get tinnitus? And the answer is no. You have to have a loss in order to get these positive signs. Okay, in the next um, video, what we're going to do is we're going to figure out how we can um, test, for, um, test for a person's hearing. And we're going to use two tests, Rini and Weber tests.